questions at the end of the session. So while Stephen is setting up, I'll do a quick introduction. So we have Stephen Guerin next. He's a CEO of SimTable. Uh, they're working on interactive, physically articulatable even sandboxes, right? So how do you create interfaces that are uh, supporting pro projection-based visualization, uh, interaction, uh, blending essentially digital content with the physical environment and the form of forced feedback, right? Uh, of sorts, uh, but uh, one of the other areas that they're, they're really known for are their agent-based algorithms, uh, looking at different techniques to actually explore data and help inform those trying to interpret it uh, with a broad range of applications to uh, first responder type scenarios, uh, search and rescue, fire, uh, and similar scenarios. Please. Thank you. And, and thank you for uh, inviting us. It's a huge honor to be here and especially to follow your talk, Javi. Um, I'm from, um, as mentioned, I'm from Santa Fe, so a little bring in, uh, you guys have terms for uh, zonies, but we're actually New Mexicanies that come into your town. Um, so uh, I teach up at the Santa Fe Institute during their complex system summer school. So if there's some graduate students here interested in uh, uh, kind of a nice uh, summer school, um, definitely uh, check that out. And this is kind of our R&D uh, little organization. We have more logos than people. So about, uh, we're about uh, four, four or five people in Santa Fe. Shout out if anyone's uh, watching online there. Um, so Santa Fe Institute spun out of, uh, how many are familiar with Santa Fe Institute? Uh, spun out of um, Los Alamos Labs in the mid 80s. Um, a lot of weapons research looking at non-equilibrium or far from equilibrium systems generating structure. Santa Fe Institute founders said, hey, there's more applications than just in physics. Can apply to economics and biology and um, other domains, even computer science. Uh, Fast forward into the 90s and 2000, a lot of uh, small companies uh, formed in Santa Fe. There's some dead parrots in here now after the dot com. Uh, but it's a uh, come out to Santa Fe. We're recruiting uh, for, uh, for machine vision and uh, uh, simulation. So, uh, so for the last uh, 15 years, I've been doing um, agent-based modeling, as was mentioned, where other disciplines you might call it individual-based modeling or micro simulation is close to it in, in traffic. Uh, so here's a, a little burning, mini uh, Burning Man that we had last uh, week, which is we basically build a 50-foot effigy and light them on fire. And then here's the, uh, the evacuation from it. So this is a little tool called NetLogo. Uh, shout out to uh, Uri Lewinsky and the group at, um, in, um, in Northwestern. It's a free uh, tool for agent-based modeling. Uh, and it's good for teaching 6th to 12th year old, uh, 6th grade to 12th grade. Uh, I highly recommend it. We use it for prototyping, but I'll show here is how do we take that kind of prototyping uh, Java environment and move it into the browser. These kinds of agent-based models, uh, that the previous one was in kind of 2D, this is 2.5D, simulating a stadium. Uh, here's a detonation for Homeland Security, unfortunately in um, like third base, right field, and then you know looking at ways of making a stadium safer for evacuation. Uh, similar types of models, in 2006 we're making cellular automata based uh, models or uh, you know, coupled with like traffic simulation. But planners would lean back and, you know, it's the lean back moment, watch it like a movie. We would go to their training scenarios that looked like this, right? So uh, tabletop exercises. Uh, this guy was the initial, uh, initial incident commander, turned over command to here. Here's the fire extent. It's the uh, first, second Main Street, kind of a mock-up of Santa Fe, but that's not what the streets look like. But for their purposes, it was good enough. All models are wrong, some are useful. So for them, uh, th this model was good enough for what they're trying to teach. For instance, here's like a staging area and uh, different kind of tactics. When we looked at this, because we're doing the simulation, you know, VR, and so I think projected augmented reality is what I'll talk about a little bit today, or spatial augmented reality, we call it ambient computing, uh, all the same kind of stuff. But um, you know, I, I was just cautious, I didn't want to put you know, goggles on this guy. And this is also the time when these guys come together, they don't meet very often. And when they're in their field, it's radio communication only. So when you have the city guys talking with the county guys, for instance, these are the uh, county, city. This is the guy up in the air tanker. Uh, you got 911 dispatch over there. How do you keep that collaborative space? So projected augmented reality, I'd argue for, is collaboration. VR, uh, much more personal, uh, immersive understanding. But when you need to make a collaborative, complex decisions together, and you know, a lot of times the model, you're never going to get all the reality onto the model. Most of the intelligence is going to be around the table, not on the table, right? 
So this is their uh, form of practice. So I'm showing a sand table in there, but we're not necessarily a sand table company. That's just our first users. Think of us as projected augmented reality, what we call any surface computing. Uh, so this is, when I first saw this, I thought it was primitive uh, as far as like a, an interface. But then I said, you know, that's kind of the future where interface needs to go to make a hill or to make a, uh, to make a road or to make the wind. You should just be able to reach out and grab it, which is kind of the connect kind of ideas. Um, this is the uh, garbage collection of the objects and threads uh, for that simulation. It's a software joke. Anyone? All right. Let's uh, move on. <clears throat> so uh, initially, we were doing, a, uh, you know, how do you scan the sand? So we're doing a structure from uh, a shape from shading uh, with some LED lights. And then we moved on to um, a structured light with the, the phase shifting. This is um, a Zhang and Huang uh, article out of uh, SUNY. So basically, it's a, a sinusoidal uh, pattern shifted in uh, 120 degrees in phase space. Um, you can hack a DLP projector, and this is in their paper, um, and do it in real-time rates at 120 hertz projectors. So you're getting 40 hertz uh, scanning, where you're uh, removing out the color wheel and putting your, your, these three images. Let me just uh, throw it down here. So these three images of the, the sinusoidal patterns would be in the red, green, and blue channels and you're just uh, keeping that same image locked in there, and you do it fast enough, it's gray light, and then here's a real-time scanner from a hacked projector. We didn't want a hacked projector, so we do it over three spatial or, or temporal scans. Um, you can read the paper of kind of how it works. It's a really kind of clever algorithm of looking at um, kind of illumination ratios. Uh, it's pixel level, uh, there's no neighborhoods to calculate, so it's a very fast algorithm. Here we're scanning the, um, the letters GFX for the Graphics Cafe that Pradeep Sen uh, started up at UNM. Um, it was also a colleague of yours, I believe. Um, so here's now recovering the height of the sand, taking advantage of the offset of the projector and the camera to get that uh, distance. Uh, and Pradeep's kind of work, the duality, there's a duality kind of between projectors and cameras. Anything you do with two cameras, you can do with a projector and a camera. Uh, so think of that in the AR and VR land. Um, just because someone's doing something with uh, two cameras, you know, the projector camera pair is also uh, pretty interesting. There's some guys in Colorado going the other direction. Instead of scanning the sand, we're projecting their elevation of their town uh, from the USGS and 10 meter data, and then laser, same camera using a, like for laser pointer interaction. So the, the idea for us is, yes, you can go with a Kinect, but we think with projection, you already have the light source. So why introduce another light source? So you'll see it in the uh, room next door with a point gray camera and a Mac mini on the back and an off the shelf projector. But we think the same thing could be done with just a, a phone and camera here with a projector and everything. Um, you know, the, the simulations we're doing are not that computationally intensive. Here's a, a cellular automata model running uphill in Santa Fe uh, following the terrain, and then there's a little wind vector up in here. And then we're doing like a slope shading based on the aspect of the sand, right, and putting some snow in there during fire season, which makes no sense. But. So we've um, been shipping this since 2009, 2011. With the Lytro camera in Siri, we got some uh, Time magazine. Uh, I think um, this is a little bit old, but mostly growing out of New Mexico. We do have one over at uh, UCS, uh, San Diego State with Eric Frost's emergency management group, um, looking at ways to integrate this more with uh, wildland fire and emergency response training. Um, so if you haven't met Eric Frost, uh, definitely check out what they're doing over there. So he has, has one set up uh, uh, most times. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, how many, um, so we think projection, uh, as, project, as light bulbs go to LEDs, we don't think it's too far off maybe to going to projectors. And if you're going to projectors, then they're just more distributed camera networks. So really, what does it take to change the light bulb? Uh, we think four developers, five months, and an NSF grant. That's kind of the punchline. <laughs> um, so this was our first prototype. Uh, 3D printed a, an iPhone with a front surface mirror and a little Pico projector down here. And so that was kind of our, our system. But now that the browser has grown up, we were doing everything in Java and C++ for the machine vision, Java for the front end, like processing. But since the browser's kind of grown up, we can now, we're starting to put all our simulation into JavaScript. Uh, if there is a kind of coding machismo, which is kind of an oxymoron, but uh, JavaScript does not have a huge, um, you know, it's growing. It's not your father's JavaScript anymore. And so the performance is there. And I would say the browser is the new OS um, for storage, distributed compute. Uh, you don't need servers for anything, uh, even the code to even launch the browser. So it's a, um, you know, talk to me about that um, if you're interested. So the, uh, with Pradeep, this was an NSF grant looking, um, when you look at a dome, uh, instead of having the physical infrastructure, this is you know, basically projection mapping. 
Kind of that duality again, you can use a spherical lens on a projector and from a sweet spot hit, hit it correctly. Your alternative is to capture it with a structured light with a spherical lens on your camera, much cheaper to, to acquire and you can move the sweet spot and not have the projector where you are. Um, and so this is, um, we'll do it in a rectangular instead of spherical in this example. But here's just uh, H.264 video streaming real time from YouTube with a full screen Chrome browser. <clears throat> and so uh, the projector's off axis so you see the distortion. So running through a, a structured light algorithm, um, a binary bit bat, uh, pattern. Here it is warping in real time in WebGL. So projection warping and, and blending, uh, but with you know, just browsers, right? And that could be then an interactive surface. So it's like, how do you take caves but get it out into the boardrooms cheaply, right? So we're working on sand in there, but this is downtown San Diego. Uh, sand is, has a certain angle of repose that uh, kind of is a limit, but now as you move to like a, a clay or a, um, a polymer clay here that you can form and then um, uh, a bake and it loses maybe one or two percent of the volume. So that's, uh, so this is now kind of sculpt by color, if you will. So here's uh, scanning it and then comparing it to the virtual model and saying, hey, this uh, hotel downtown needs to be a little bit taller. This one's too tall. This is Petco Stadium. It's kind of Goldilocks. It's just right. And then, um, then we're doing like, uh, here's a plume simulation of chlorine release. Here's the convention center traffic models, which I'll show you on the table. And then projecting that information back onto the clay, right? City of Boston. Um, now, the same way of calibrating your projectors, um, think about calibrating the camera in Google Earth to be in the right position with unknown optics of your projector. So if I wanted to project on here, basically finding, um, depending on the camera model, seven or nine degrees of freedom, for your camera model, three for position, rotation, and focal lengths, and there may be some radial distortion. So we find seven points in this case of uh, uh, correspondence, and then here's Google Earth uncalibrated, and then calibrated. So taking, so we call this live texture, live texture mapping from your digital models, but then what I wanna talk about now is how do we go the, kind of complete the loop and say, how do we take our real-time imagery from cameras on scene build up 3D point clouds and project them back onto our scene, whether in virtual or in the, in the physical reality. Here's just um, an example of anyone can make a KML, save a, a flood inundation model in Google Earth, and then we're just pumping that out onto the model. I'm filming with my phone, so it's a little crummy. So here's going the other way. Here's a, um, in Boston looking at Fenway uh, Stadium from a, the Sheraton webcam. So what if you knew uh, the location? So we've only need seven points of correspondence to calibrate a camera. Um, and then maybe you know where the street lights are or a crosswalk or a bus moving through the scene or you have seven frames where you know where the sun is and time of day and lat long. Then the idea is to get a lat long elevation for every pixel as opposed to just having the GPS location of your camera, right? So then we can use that as a texture map uh, back into the real scene. So very similar to um, uh, the archaeology talk this morning. Here's uh, again uh, some quick demos. Here's my son. Hey, Miles. And then some, some of our developers. So this is the Santa Fe Institute, and we're flying above this, and we're gonna throw it into Agisoft, similar to this morning. As, but this was kind of testing the, the, the pipeline. Here's where you find the matching points, building up a, a, a point cloud of the system. And so this is, uh, oops, uh, let me uh, zoom to here. And then the idea is uh, putting it uh, with georectified points. Here's estimating where the, uh, the drone is, and then putting it into Google Earth. So this is a single camera moving over time, but what we're trying to go is, what if you have multiple mobile phones out there building up a real-time scene, especially when you have things uh, like this in uh, Tianjin. Um, I, don't know if, I didn't test the audio here. Let's see if this works. So uh, this was the chemical explosion for a couple of weeks ago. Uh, not many, uh, so you have synchronized based on the light um, you'll see that they're offset in time because of the, the shock wave. So you may have seen this online, but this kind of gives you an idea. Anything on audio? I'm not getting anything up here. All right, let me go this way. So initially filming the fire on social media using tools like Geophedia to... Yeah, so this camera's taken out. And then maybe three seconds later on the shockwave here. So 
So to be a smart city, what would it be to be able to see where that, that is in real time, change your lights in real time, instead of waiting for your emergency responders to come in 45 minutes to an hour later to figure out what's going on. There's enough information in the GIS of where these street lights are, where these roads are, building information, or a calibrating off the, the flashes. So here's the larger explosion. Let's get out of here. A... Quickly. <clears throat> um, so, so I've shown you the table is kind of where we're at, and, and, and this is kind of what we're looking to do, and why maybe uh, partnering with some uh, researchers here that are you know, good multi-view geometry researchers uh, to do this stuff in real time. And I'll show you how, you know, kind of some of the things we're thinking about here so far. So we lost the guys at Granite Mountain Hot Shots uh, uh, two summers ago. Uh, and and this, this information was, on, was being shot, but not used, right? So here's the, the, the firefighters are down, moving towards the safety zone over in here on the other side of this mountain. But, you know, this, this video comes in for an after action review. But that could be useful information on scene instead of waiting for the infrared flyover every night. Um, so can we actually locate that, um, you know, the, the camera pose in real time, and then with multiple cameras, get what that plume is doing, right? So here's uh, an example of when those, uh, one of the firefighters was also at SMSing uh, home. Now, coverage is always an issue, but you know, many, if you do have you know, uh, cellular access, we should be able to use that data, right? So here's, um, they're working up in the black here, uh, kind of pointing their, uh, their next move, but knowing you know, where that, being able to rectify and get the camera poses on these things and what, these, what the plume is doing is kind of the next bit. And then, so here's a chariot fire here in San Diego. Here's coming the information then coming the other way. If every pixel has a lat long in elevation, well then you should be able to put your AVL data for your vehicles in there, as well as um, um, you know, you know, labeling them in here. Or when that bulldozer turns on. Or, or specifying that I, I need to go up this to protect this um, HP REN site uh, for uh, San Diego Gas and Electric. We need to bring a bulldozer line up this uh, area. So instead of a 2D annotation on a camera, that should be a 3D GIS uh, polygon, right? So that, uh, that as those bulldozers are digging that line, they could have been following, you know, being able to annotate your, your video with 3D information, right? So what can we do in real time with social media? So this is the Lowell fire between, uh, on the way to um, Lake Tahoe from Sacramento. This was maybe in July that we were playing around. So what? Can, so with things like Geofideo, you can circle an area and get all the, you know, 10 major uh, social media. So here's some raw photos coming in. So how do, can we estimate camera pose? Things like Geofido give you a rough estimate of where it is. Um, but from that, you know, uh, I think the volunteers is a cute term that are sitting by, willing to do some things to, to help out. Now, if they're using your app, or then you have the telemetry of the uh, GPS and the orientation. But let's just say this is raw with no information. So we just need uh, seven to nine points of um, correspondence. Uh, maybe even three would be enough. So finding the same scene and, um, you know, here's a railroad track passing over uh, I-80. So then once we're in here, you know, these points in Google Earth, if you click on them, gives you lat long and elevation down in here and there's an API to get at that stuff. So that could calibrate that image. Here's another one and you kind of find the concrete here. Geofidia is giving you a rough location, but from here those are enough points of correspondence to get you in the neighborhood. Here's another scene on, on I-80. This sign, you know, finding it in Street View. Here's one where you have an error in the uh, street painting, um, and also some tar, interesting tar patches. Moving through Street View and finding it, or Google Earth View, you know, finding that same point here. Or acutely, uh, here's the moon. So having altitude and azimuth information for time of day. So, um, so this is, um, as you give citizens more information, uh, you know, as they're seeing what the scene is, they can also turn on their cameras. So this is a quick, uh, let's see if this works here. So imagine I'm in uh, this room, which I am. So we'll call this, um, and we call this live texture. So I'll be uh, Chief Jurgen on this uh, fire. Oh, let me uh, launch this. 
So imagine I get a tweet from an uh, emergency manager or from um, whatever broadcast I'm kind of signed up for. Um, we have GPS on here. And it's saying now one camera is available, right? But as for privacy, and, um, and this is kind of an idea of surveillance, you've probably heard of it versus surveillance. Sous chef is from below, sir is from above. So how do you have citizen-based observation instead of oversight, undersight of, of things? Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a movement. Uh, so anyway, so maintaining privacy while you're doing this stuff and having agent-mediated uh, uh, sensor collection, right? So it's saying I'm in this location, but I'm not gonna give you beyond this geohash where I am until you request my location and tell me who you are and why. And then I get an alert from Jurgen. okay, it's a big fire, yeah, I'll give you my position a little bit better. It's giving me a better location. Now Jurgen kind of sees, hey, you're kind of over in here, and if I um, publish my uh, uh, sensor information as well, you know, what way am I looking? But then saying, okay, you got a really good coverage of that fire plume, or, you know, unfortunately, shooter on campus or some other thing. Now do you mind giving me your feed? And this is browser to browser um, going, yeah, crap, this isn't. Imagine, see that video? Imagine that was over here, too. That's a bad demo. But you kind of get the idea where that's going. I got, we just got something going with the signaling. That happened earlier today, too. So imagine being able to take that feed and now having those. And with two points uh, doing the, uh, oh, let's see if this, no. Okay, that's it. Um, 250 or 255? You're good? Five, five, four. So you get the idea there. Um, yeah, so, so here's also another place we're going. If you think of, you know, you'll see a Mac Mini and a projector and uh, a point grade camera. But just imagine, we, we showed this to Secret Service, and they saw the sand table, and they said, well, we don't do terrain. And we said, well, any surface, and it's, not, it's a lot like uh, Hiro Ishii's uh, tangible computing, a lot of inspiration from there um, uh, at MIT. Um, so here's like just an example here. Um, so imagine an HTML5 application starting up. And so imagine a projector connected to a phone looking down at the surface, 12 megapixel camera is good enough. Do we want to look at what's going on now or what's going on uh, after action review, say for the inauguration, different aspects of the inauguration? We'll look at the parade here. Zoom into an area of interest. And so now we're uh, broadcasting the center point and the zoom level uh, to the other phone. So we have two phones and a projector, right? So as we put this on the table, put a, a a binary pattern on there, the front facing camera learns where it was in projector space. And now that's an active object. And so let's spin out a map at that scale and then accelerometer and compass information and gyro doing a rotation. So just using browsers and phones, right, and a projector. No connects. Or um, instead of using a laser pointer, putting down whiteboard markers and tracking whiteboard, you know, converting the raster of a whiteboard marker to a vector. So we'll take a picture of that and say, what, what game object do you want that to represent? For, if it's a marker on a decision tree, let that be a medical evacuation route. So as we draw this raster from the camera's perspective, constraining that to open street map, and that's a vector, and that would be the evacuation, right? And that would go to the cloud. Or tapping, tracking the convex hull of what's in the scene, and then here's what Google Transit feed data is showing uh, based on the subway at uh, Metro Center Station or Chinatown. Um, a lot of the um, AR tool sets for doing um, object recognition. So here's a vehicle of President's Limo that you can get at BWI gift shop at the airport. Too big for the map, so scale the map. And then we're piecing together an after action review from public information. So estimating where uh, POTUS and FLOTUS, uh, President and First Lady, Secret Service detail, motorcade. Here's just a, a simple crowd model trying to get the closest view to the president, not allowed to go beyond the blue lines. Uh, document management is kind of in this example. <clears throat> what if we're, we're, any document we find, we're gonna look for names and randomly assign them to a security detail. So giving the visual feedback to the users. Or turning on the social media, and here's what's on YouTube, maybe. So here's maybe a journalist view versus a citizen view. 
and we're syncing up like the Tianjin example, the, the start times of these videos, the car establishes the, the point in time of the parade. So as we move the car, we're moving the digital assets and the video assets forward and backward in time, right? So building up interactive tools, um, so projected AR, uh, spatial augmented reality. Uh, the last bit here is um, uh, phones are fantastic for authentication, so being able to say, give me the uh, data here, and move it to another black frame projector there, or uh, zoom up time here. Putting down everyday objects down like a Washington Monument or a salt shaker. So two points of correspondence, like the Washington Monument and the Capitol Building, establishes the scale and rotation of a map. So the Capitol, Washington Monument, National Mall between them, right? Now, if we want to zoom in on the map, we'll move the capital over there, Washington there. Now north zooms to the up here. And now that, 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 that becomes our simulation service. Or from an object recognition, if you have a single object that's asymmetric, that'll give you scale and rotation. And then imagine texture mapping that with a real-time video and uh, video feeds, right? And then putting your simulations on there. If I move that object, that's just a rotation. Okay. 